Um, I could introduce myself first. I'm uh, Thomas Bjorklund and I'm uh, Assistant Professor of Neuroscience. I run a small research group on A10. So I just established my group back in 2011, so it's uh, quite new. And I have uh, two PhD students and two master students and a lab tech. So we're working a bit on uh, gene therapy in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's uh, disease. Um, but this course is uh, something a little bit different. So why we have this is because I started looking at how we have always done our uh, illustrations and how we run um, our planning for figures in presentations and in journals and how important it is to make sure that they look nice nowadays, not only in the printed version but actually in the online part of our papers. And the reason why online is so important is that nowadays 90-95% of all our readers are looking at the version that comes electronically. So if we uh, publish in a way that it looks okay printed but not nice electronically, we sort of fail most of our readers. And we want to make sure that what we do carries on to a nice PDF. That's normally the goal of the publication, is a nice PDF version of our research. And that takes quite a lot of thinking. So uh, I started looking at the different techniques and where the limitations are for most scientists where we're working. And it's the fundamentals of understanding differences between uh, pixel-based graphics and vector graphics and how we work with vector-based graphics. So, so that's the condensate that I thought I'll try to focus on today is uh, the fundamentals of imaging and how our pictures work and why they look the way they do in the end. And if we get some time in the last part, I'll try to show you some tricks on how to get the best out of and how to get started with applications like Illustrator. And Illustrator is one of those uh, software that's a bit tricky to get into, but it's very powerful and it's very useful for most scientists. And I'll try to tell you why um, Illustrator is a much better bet than Photoshop for majority of your things and why actually Photoshop is the least important application for you to know and the, all the others are much better tools to use. And I hope we can have sort of a bit of an interaction because we are this small group. It's nicer if you can, if you have questions, just blurt them out in the middle uh, and then we'll just take those as they come along. Um, any questions on that? No. Good. So why we are looking at images is actually just a way to represent our data. So everything we do is to generate data and how to uh, actually interpret data. And it's one way is to just put up your data in a row, but it doesn't please us and it doesn't help us to get the knowledge out of that. Hello, how are you? Welcome. So what, what we always want to do is try to uh, get from a data point into something that we can actually by eye interpret and start to see patterns. And images help us with those patterns. And why, why I brought up this guy is that because he's uh, one of the first big giants in the field. He's called Claude Shannon. And he worked back at Bell Labs. And back in his days, this is back in 48, um, the concept of actually making something uh, like images and sound and other concepts digital was very new. So how do we get from something that we can touch and feel and see to something that we can store and transfer digitally. And that's uh, where he came in. And he started to realize that everything that's out in our biology can be uh, condensated down to numbers. Just as our genetic code describes our biology, also we can start to divide up sound waves, um, also numbers of photons in a, our surrounding to make pictures, but also now more and more when it comes to other senses as smell and hearing um, and taste, we can then start to actually make those into digital concepts. And the concept that I wanted just to describe today is the way of uh, dividing something up into small bits. So if you take a sound wave, you can start to describe this wave as just two 
a top and the lower part of this wave. Uh, just two bits, top and bottom. But that wouldn't sound as the sound that you're putting in. So the more and more you divide it up into smaller blocks, the closer to reality that looks the sound. And that's the same thing when it comes to images, that the smaller the bins that you use to describe something, the closer to reality that looks as well. And in images we talk about resolution and pixel size. But in this uh, uh, sound then, then it's more about the sampling frequency, that uh, how many times you actually start to measure the height of each of these waves. So in everything that we make digital, we are approximating something that normally had an infinite resolution. So in sound you always have this wave and in our surrounding we don't have anything that's based on resolution. So when, when going digital you always get rid of some of that information. It's just a question how much do you get rid of and how much is enough to keep. And this is one of the balances where you need to think a little bit more on what to keep. So what is then an image? We normally think about an image as maybe something we take with a camera. And that's, of course, the majority of things that we get in uh, as, that we represent as images. And this is just uh, something that many of you know what it is. It's a, a chemiluminescent Western blot. And this is sort of just giving you the fundamental of how an image is built up. You have a source that is emitting photons towards your CCD camera that's in your detector that is creating your images. And this is bringing up the images because it's counting the number of photons that hits each of these small pixels in that camera. And you choose then the time uh, bin to calculate the number of <coughs> photons that get to that sensor part. And with that you see that it's, it's very uh, defined on two factors how good your image is. It's the number of photons that can reach uh, this pixel and it's the number of those pixels in your camera that gives the resolution. But if you have a finite amount of photons that can reach the camera, as it is in a chemiluminescence, you then have to start to make a trade-off. Either you have very small pixels and you can then fit a lot of them into the CCD, but then the chance of each photon hitting one of these is much smaller. So you start to divide all your photons into smaller and smaller containers and that comes at the price of sensitivity and noise. So if you want to go up sometimes in resolution, you always lose signal quality. So your signal to noise ratio will go down and your image will look worse even though it has better resolution. So this is just a take home message of this image is never to think about resolution of an image as a, a be all end all. You shouldn't just see uh, equipment, take the highest resolution of it, and then think that that will give you the best quality of your image. Because it so much depends on what you're starting from. If you're starting from a source that has a lot of uh, photons that can be emitted, or if photons is a limited resource. And in Western blot, this absolutely is a limited resource, but also when it comes to scanning confocal microscope, for example, where you have to excite your fluorophores with a laser. And that laser will start to deteriorate your fluorophore, so it has to go rather fast through it and scan like this. And then your resolution will also be finite. So many of our scientific images have finite resolution, where we just need to find this balance. But then uh, this is, of course, uh, giving you an image from data that comes from photons, but it doesn't have to be in the visual spectrum. That's the good thing we can use other parameters and visualize them in images. And of course, if we take flow cytometry, that's one way where we actually create images out of something that does not have its own visual appearance in a two-dimensional space. We're just creating those pictures artificially and showing them to ourselves. But that could, it could also be from autoradiography and uh, many other parameters we can visualize as images. And it doesn't really matter for our concept, it's just that we need to know that each voxel is a data point that has its, its height variable that's in there, and we need to maintain those in a nice way. So that's when we're looking at black and white color, and that's the trivial part where you're just uh, counting the number of photons. When we're starting to then describe color, things become a little bit more complex. And as you all know, the color of white light is 
just a composite of all these other wavelengths together. And that's how we, uh, this uh, looks as white light for us. But with a prism, you see that it can be divided up to all these component colors. And this is what we call additive coloring. So if you would go in this uh, from the right to left instead, you would then see that if you add all these colors together, you get white. And this is the classical way that we visualize colors on a computer screen. And then you have the composition of the three primary colors, red, green, and blue. So when you put those red, green, and blue together you, and shine through it, you will see that it will, will become white. And this can be done in a computer screen where you have a light source behind yourself behind the specimen and it shines to you. So you, you see the white light coming. But how do you do when you need to get from this into a printed page? Because there's no light shining behind the page, not at least in normal pages. In an iPad it's different, but for a printed page we need another way of, of representing color. And the way we do that is to have something called subtractive coloring. And now you st start to see that things look very different. That when you add colors together, n regardless of how many colors you mix, they won't become white. And what will become instead is a murray blackish looking color, which is in the middle here. And this is coming from the traditional printing presses. How can we make the most uh, colors with the fewest primary colors as possible. Because when you're making pr plates for a printer, you don't want to make uh, 16 million plates with each of different colors. You want to have them as few as possible. And they realize that you can manage quite well with only four plates. And these are three of them where you have the cyan, yellow, and magenta. And those three colors together can mix to most of the other colors in our color space. But as you see, the black in itself is not very uh, distinctly black. And when printing, you really want black to shine out. So they added the last color. And this is called key, because it, the key has the variable of everything that is giving your detail in an image. And that comes from the black. So this color space is called CMYK. And it's important for you to know, because that's the uh, color space where your publications will be printed where the, uh, the, print, uh, the journals always have to have a copy that's printed in CMYK. So in one place or the other, all, everything you do will have to be converted into this color space. And that's actually a quite a big deal, um, because it doesn't look as nice uh, and saturated as the RGB color space. On a projector like this, the, the difference is not dramatic, but on your computer screen, you know that you can really get very nice pic uh, pictures out there, and when you print them, they look dull. So that's why you need to understand how this works, and trying to find the best way around that. So why does it look this different? And that's the why, because we can't uh, reproduce all colors that we can see. That's still a big problem for us. So in the background here, these are estimates on how we see color. So the horseshoe shape in the back is then the whole color space that we can see with our eyes. And the largest triangle here is a professional computer screen. So you see that a professional computer screen can visualize almost all of that, but is missing some parts on the outer part there. And then when you start to go down into cheaper computer screens, it's like the Adobe RGB there, and a projector like this one probably is more close to the uh, sRGB, where you see the smallest uh, triangle here. And you start to see that you are losing some of these saturated colors. Um, and then when you have a printed space, it becomes even worse. It has this sort of amoeboid uh, shape in the center there. And that... So we have limitations when we're going to a printed uh, page, and we need to know how to handle that. And this can unf unfortunately make it look quite bad. So this is again something that's difficult to uh, show on a projector, but maybe you can actually see the difference on this laptop. So this is a 
pseudo-colored GFP image, just as you normally uh, are used to seeing it when you take it from the confocal image uh, microscope. But on the right there, it's the same image that's converted to CMYK. And this is what you normally see then when you uh, print this in a journal, that all of your fluorescent images are looking quite bad. And it's so bad that actually the guy that started to uh, make GFP useful and who got the Nobel Prize for GFP, he had a big argument with science for the cover. The graphic editors for science said that, yeah, you have very nice uh, C. elegans looking green here, but we can't print that green. Can't we make it red instead? So they wanted to sue the color his GFP red. So it actually took him a week to convince science that no GFP should be green in, in the cover. But it's, it's a big uh, problem for everybody that's working on, on uh, uh, fluorescence is how to maintain this in the best looking way. And it's become easier and easier because as I said in the beginning, we are now in a state where the printed version of our journal is so little spread. They become printed almost just because they should. In the, in the cases, not, it, it's not true for uh, n nature and science. Many people still have them in printed copies. I do. I prefer it as a printed version as well. But for many of our other journals, most readers are for the digital version. So why do we convert it into the CMYK space if everybody will have the digital copy anyway? And that's why things are actually starting to change that you can push the journals to get your pictures published in RGB instead, if you have fluorescent images. So that's one take-home message for you guys, is to actually push back towards the journals when you're submitting, and they ask you for CMYK version of all your fluorescent images, is to tell them that, no, you prefer them to have them in the digital form in RGB. And then your PDFs will look perfect, just as they were when you had it yourself, and it's only if people print it that it will look bad. So that is something that they do actually accept today after a little bit of negotiation, because they also realize that your uh, fluorescent images will look much nicer in that color space. So the second part is to think about when you're bringing in your data, how to uh, make sure that what you take in is what you have in the end. That you don't lose information all through your processes. Because it can be quite a long process from when you acquire an image until your whole figure is, is set. There can be many rounds of revisions, many fine editings and small adjustments. And all of these things can make a dramatic difference of, on your images if you're not careful and you're not, if you don't know what you're doing. And one of those things is uh, maintaining resolution of an image. So the images here uh, that you see on the left and the right side are dramatically different in size. So you see the left one is a 26 megabyte image and the right one is 1.4. But on this uh, projector, and this is just a normal full HD projector, it looks the same. But they have, uh, and actually on the right side you may see that it has a little bit better detail than the left. And that has to do with the scale down on the image to fit on a screen. So how come that you need to have resolution that's higher than what you see on a screen? And that has to do with the resolution of the things that we are uh, seeing on images like this. So um, let me just skip. Uh, no, I'll start on the other side, actually. I'll get back to the computer screen resolution. But why they look uh, different is that you cannot, uh, on a computer screen, see all the resolution that you can on a printed page. Not yet. But on a retina display and on your s smartphones, uh, there, the resolution is higher and higher. So you can start to see more and more of those pixels. But it's most of the time you're just seeing a, a low resolution approximation of your image. And to see it uh, in the, its full resolution, you normally have to scale up. So if you start to scale up on a part of that original image like this, you start to see the differences between the left and the right images. In the left one, you still maintain spines and the ability to detect all these axons there. But on the right one, 
it's really just a, a low resolution approximation of that. So we need to actually know what our end usage will be of our images when we acquire them. And you may not know, always know that. It may be so that you think about, uh, well, this will only become a small panel in, in part of a figure. But then that paper becomes a nice paper and you want to present it on a poster. So then you want to go for an image that would be maybe A4 size instead. And when you're printing those two versions you had that looked fine for the small version and you scale them up, you see that you can only scale the right version up to something that's uh, maybe 5 by 5 centimeters large versus the right one you could fit in a full of A4 page with that image. And then it's, today it doesn't cost you anything to store more data. Data is very cheap. Hard disks are cheap. Memory is cheap. So the, the best investment when you're acquiring images is always to maintain as much information as you can in that image. So if you remember what I said in the start that sometimes you have to go down in resolution for sensitivity, that's still true. And then you want to find, on the other side of things, you want to find the best resolution you can to keep that uh, future proof for what you do in, in, in your studies. So you want to find that uh, area of uh, emergence of lowest resolution to get high, high signal as possible and highest resolution to maintain flexibility. And that's where you want to stick with the images and stay with that forever. Don't take your images and then start to downscale them because that will really make life hard in the future. And there are many good applications now. Unfortunately, I can't show you a lot of this today, but um, on the other movies you can also see how to work with InDesign. And InDesign is a very nice application for making montages out of all of these uh, uh, pixel-based graphics. And uh, in that application, it just keeps links to your original images. You don't place them in like you would in um, PowerPoint, for example. So it doesn't matter if your image is one megabyte or a gigabyte large. It will be the same when that application puts it all together. And it then outputs it in the right resolution for what you're submitting for the journal. So if you use uh, professional applications like that, there's no issue for you to maintain all your full resolution of your images and maintain them in the right way. <clears throat> so when we are now thinking about resolution, there, are, there is another aspect that can make it even easier for you to handle when you're working with graphics, illustrations, text, and other parts that do not have to be and shouldn't be based on square pixels. And this is showing you that example that we have on the uh, left side here. So the ABC in the top look on the screen identical in that size. When, but when you magnify them, you see that the, they are based on three different concepts. So on the left there you have 72 dots per inch. And this means that there in one inch you have 72 times 72 pixels. And this was the classical resolution of a computer screen. So that's why that is normally used as a resolution for an image that would only be used at that size on a computer screen. Never enlarged and never reduced as well, just on that size. Then 72 dots per inch was fine. Now with the retina displays of uh, modern computers with a high resolution, it's no longer true that that would be the best looking for your computer to screen. So nowadays most people when using pixel based graphics they say that 300 dots per inch is the lowest you want to go to maintain something that looks smooth both on a computer screen but also on a printed page. So when you're working with um, photos and you scale them for printing you should make sure that you have 300 pixels per inch in that image. You shouldn't enlarge it larger than that if you don't absolutely have to. Um, but on the right side here you see then the part that is always going to look much much better and that's representing your uh, lettering and your arrows and other things as vectors. 
And this makes it so that you have an indefinitely scalable resolution of that. So when you're talking about vector-based graphics, you no longer have resolution of them. They are based on just instructions of how to draw this B. And how can you draw a B like this? Um, is if you work with either uh, straight vectors or curved vectors. So this is now again showing you how big difference this can make uh, for uh, the representation of the same B as I talked about earlier. So this is the 72 DPI. And then we start to try representing that B with straight lines. And when you add more and more straight lines to a B, you start to see that you can uh, approximate it rather well. So uh, already at maybe 100 lines, that B starts to look almost as good or even better than the pixel-based version. And with just 227 lines, it's much smoother than it would be if you used 11,000 pixels. So you see that there's dramatic uh, differences and abilities to save uh, data points by actually in, uh, keeping the instructions on how to draw this B instead of uh, keeping the drawing of the B. And that difference is, is a big thing that maintains also our ability to go in and change this B. Because if we have it based on the lines, you can go in and fine tune the lines and modify them and make it look nicer without trying to just uh, delete uh, pixels. But there is one step that makes this even more efficient and that's going from only lines to actually lines with bends. And that's what we call the Bezier curves. So in the B here, and I'll show you how that looks in reality then, it has um, actually these points. I should have the pointer, would have been nice. Um, Okay. Take this one. So when you start to use Bezier curves instead, you can have points at parts that are not straight. So you can put a point and it says that it, there should be a curve in between these points. And then you start, can start to go down from all these 227 straight lines to just 28 points. And then you keep track of all of these um, bendings and it makes that B look perfect also if you would scale it even larger. But when it comes to type you have also the ability to reference like we do in our own memory we have uh, the reference of a face and then we put characteristics on that so we don't have to remember that everybody has a face and it's the same thing with lettering if you have a typeface that actually you can make a reference to your standard B and it just keeps track where that B should be, how large it should be, if it's bold, if it's uh, other changing parameters. But it doesn't need to keep track of all these points in that B. It can reconstruct the B based on that reference that it should be of the typeface uh, Times New Roman and it should be of the size 12. And then it can rebuild that every time you need to draw it. That has pros and cons. Because if you have the typeface into your drawing, you always need to maintain that uh, link to the typeface. So if you make a, a nice um, montage where you have a lettering of a very specific typeface and your printer, they don't have it, or the publisher, they don't have that typeface, it wouldn't uh, at all show up. So your, uh, your montage will not look good if you submit it with references to type. Fortunately, there are very good ways of easily m migrating from the typeface into the Spezier curves at the end when you have done all your uh, images and presentations. And when they're ready for publishing, you can then go from this point to here. And then you get the best of both worlds. You can easily change the text, but then you can also make sure that you can print it in every place possible. Okay, so um, next I thought I would describe a little bit to you uh, where I see sort of the creative suite fitting into our workflow of data. And have you heard about this creative suite from Adobe? So how many of you have it? 
available on your computer or access to? I'm not yeah. able to <laughs> No, but at least you, you could if you knew how to use it. No, but that's excellent. And um, so actually just as an advert, we will have the same uh, three-day illustration course this autumn. And if you attend that course, you will actually get this software package for free. So if you don't have access to it before, it can be a good excuse to go. And it's a free course, so it can be good value for money. Um, and this software is now doing something that I think m m more and more software is doing. And it's dividing up your workflow in containers. Instead of trying to make one application that can do everything and would be huge, bulky, and annoying, you start to divide it up into the functions that you use separately. And the software that you need to be familiar with are these five. There are many other ones that are for video workflow, soft, um, sound and music and other concepts and animation that may be less important for you to use right now. But these are the ones that I use actually almost daily in when we prepare figures. And, but I use them for very specific things. And how I see it is that you should see your workflow going from the left to right in this picture. And sometimes you will end uh, only here, sometimes you would end there, or you would go all the way to this end here. And on this side you have the place where you get your raw data in. And uh, you prepare it for making figures. And it could be from uh, your uh, microscopes, it can be from any statistics, uh, or it could be measurement values from your qPCR, flow cytometer or other parts. But not very uncommon, you also may want to start with things that come from PDFs. That's not maybe so for um, original data, although I'll show you places where it's really good to use the PDF file format in between. But it can very often be for presenting in a journal club. You want to make a rapid presentation of your field or a, a journal um, paper that's published and you just want to take in images for your presentations and th then it's very good to be able to use uh, PDFs in combination with Illustrator. That's the absolutely best way to prepare uh, original figures that have been published for your own presentations. And I'll show you some tricks on that that can really make a difference when you want to make nice uh, journal club presentations. So that's your in data, and you want to make sure that you retain all the best quality from these guys when you go to the next step. And here I've put the Illustrator and InDesign parallel. And why they are parallel like this is that they are the entry point for two different concepts. So you need to, from the start, think about what do I want to end up with my whole figure. And the way I think about it is, do I have pixel-based images that are the important part of my figure? And if the answer is yes, then I always start with InDesign. So Illustrator, and this is where I see people get annoyed with Illustrator early, is if they, you try to use Illustrator to put in photos and data that is not vector-based. So Illustrator is for your vector-based uh, drawings, illustrations, data that you can export in vector format like graphs, um, plots and other things. That should go always directly into Illustrator. But photos should never go via Illustrator. They should always go directly into InDesign. And here I'll get back to that, but I think you in most cases should skip Photoshop. Photoshop should not be part of the routine, it should be on the extremes when you have to use Photoshop. But I'll get back to that. But then uh, it's so that InDesign is often your container of all your different parameters. You have photos in there, text in there, and illustrations that you can put in from Illustrator. So you make the illustrations in Illustrator, then you put it as one panel in your figure, and then that goes to publication. But it's also fine to go directly from Illustrator to publication if you don't have any photos in it. 
then you don't need to go to step via InDesign. But it, InDesign is really that uh, center for all your different data types that go together into figures. And uh, it can also handle multiple pages. So when it comes to the day when you're going to write your thesis, this is where all that thesis will come together. And you can make everything into the whole book. So it scales very well from a single uh, multi-panel montage up to a thousand page book in, uh, in uh, a very good way. So that, that's a good software to learn already from the start because when you're at the day of writing your thesis you don't want to spend too many uh, days uh, fighting with your software. You will do that anyway, I guess. But, uh, so this is sort of uh, the general workflow that I want to propose you to think about is that to have uh, those as, as the core of your workflow, Illustrator and InDesign, and see Photoshop as only that uh, extreme in, in our case. It's a very useful software if you work in um, marketing and in uh, this making adverts and other things where you really want to mess around with your images and make all of these composites there. But in our field, it's a software that um, has its own challenges because it's so easy to start inducing things in Photoshop that you both lose quality of your original data, but also start to induce things that are not scientifically correct to do. And it's like this, that um, you want to make sure that you can follow your own workflow from your original image to the thing that's published. And this becomes more and more true today. And in the future, they, many of the publishers are also thinking about asking for the source images for everything that you acquire. Because images are so powerful for us, it's the place where we actually do evaluate the accuracy of science is by looking at people's figures and see, do they look uh, true to us? Do they seem like valid? representations of what they're trying to convince us of. And that's why we can start to fool people by adjusting images in the wrong way. So we need to make sure that we're not uh, doing things with our images that are changing what reality is. And that's where Photoshop can become the, the uh, problematic place. So when I started thinking about this, I looked at what people use Photoshop for. And one of those things that people use Photoshop for is uh, this. Um, sorry, I'll just plug this into here. For a sec. So, uh, removing dust is uh, one of those things when you work with uh, uh, microscopy data, changing white balance. And do you know what white balance is? Um, so, white balance is something that our eye does all the time. And it's changing the concept of how we interpret uh, a color. So it's so that if you look at the printed page with black and white on it, the black on that printed page, when I'm sitting indoors with a light like this, has the si same light and color as actually the white on that paper um, Sorry, the opposite. Uh, the, the white on that paper is shining the same amount of photons as the black would if you're out in bright sunlight. So it's just that, but it looks black and white for our eye when we're sitting indoors because we have accommodated and adjusted for the light environment that we're in here. But when we're going out to bright sunlight, all of that changes. And also, the color spectra changes if we're in an incandescent light or if we're out in bright sunlight or if we were using a flashlight, for example. So, but our eye can adjust to that and we see skin color being the same. We see white being white regardless of the light that we have around us. <coughs> but our cameras cannot do that. They are taking the same color information regardless of how the surrounding is. And we need to adjust that, otherwise it would look very artificial for us. The, uh, say if you take a picture with your small uh, pocket camera and it doesn't adjust the white balance and you have a flash, it will look all bluish. Everything would look blue because that light is so blue light. But it's, it's adjusting it and make all those colors warm. And this is what we call white balance. 
because it's trying to adjust everything so that white is always white and 50% gray is always uh, sort of this gray always is natural uh, neutral gray and this is something that we often need to do with images uh, post hoc if we are not careful when we're adjusting this on our microscopes and other uh, acquisition parts as well. Another thing that uh, many people do is crop and rotate images, change the sizes of images, annotate their images, and insert scale bars and lettering in images. And then uh, also some people do the photo montages. And my argument is like this, that you should actually use Photoshop for nothing of these. That there is not a single part here that Photoshop does in the best way. It's, it's a place where you can do these things, but it doesn't mean that you should. And there are many arguments why you should not do any of these things in Photoshop. So the first part is actually a bit different from the rest in the place that it's much, much better to do these things before you take the image. And it's, it's one of the things, think about also focus of an image. That's the uh, most straightforward thing. There are many uh, sharpening tools in your software, but it will never look as good as if you actually focus well before you take the image. So that sounds trivial, but it's, the other parts are also the same way, that if you just make sure that your data is as clean and nice looking before you make the acquisition, if you make your gels for your western blot the best you can, spend time on the acquisition there, um, reduce the amount of dust in the air in your microscopy room. That's one of those key aspects to making nice images, is just to make sure that you have a clean environment. And that's also trivial, uh, but it's not as easily managed because, yeah, cleaning is what cleaning is, but that's one place you can really save a lot of time, just making sure that you have clean and well-working uh, instruments. The other part here is also <coughs> so that you can make something look much, much nicer by fitting things in the right spectra of your acquisition tool. And that's uh, one thing that I would also urge you to look at when you're acquiring, and this comes for fluorescence images, it's uh, for uh, bright field images and everything else, is to make sure that your, the data that you're getting in is trying to fill your whole spectra of light so that you're not taking a very dark image and then increasing the light of it or the opposite that you're actually trying to adjust your exposure to be exactly in the right middle field of your camera because then the camera has the best ability to acquire this image and it has the best sensitivity and will look the best always so it's it's much more powerful to do this before you press uh, the uh, acquire button than doing it after and the other thing is to do with uh, white light and white balance when you're working with bright field microscopy. And it's so that our microscopes can change the voltage of the lamp. And the voltage of that lamp will change the color of the lamp as well. So if you go down in voltage, um, often below 10 volts, it then will be looking yellow. And if you go uh, up in voltage close to the maximum, it will be blue light. So all microscopes have a place where the uh, light source is giving white light. And you normally have an indication. Either you have a button that says sort of the white light or phot photographic light, or you can adjust it to that level where this indicator is. And you should always keep the light on that place. And, uh, but then there can be arguments saying that, well, if I al always have the light at that point, I have too much light in or too little light. But you should always keep it there and then adjust with neutral density filters. And these are gray filters that are in your microscope. And they are called ND5, ND10, ND50. And they are just how much light they uh, give through. But they are uh, submitting light through in a, a very even way. So those two parameters together, having the light at white and adjusting with gray filters will make all the differences in, in your images. So that's also worthwhile experimenting if you're working a lot on bright field microscopy. So you may think that your camera is crap, but it's actually these things that are changing that uh, your camera cannot get in the best uh, data. So it's very much worthwhile spending time there 
um, that you will have to reduce that amount that would have to be done in uh, a post um, modification software. And so there, uh, I normally say to my students is that every minute you spend there uh, on fine tuning, you easily save 10 minutes in post production. So that, that's clearly one place that you can save time. And then uh, junk in is always junk out in one way or the other. I mean, the, you, can, you can rescue it, you can put lipstick on a pig, but it's still a pig. So that's uh, something you always want to keep in mind. And the other part to bring in is that these things that you do on an image, changing exposure and other things, are always much better done in the software that knew where the picture came from. So if, if it's your confocal uh, imaging software or other parameters, you get a better quality if you do that adjustment before you expo uh, export it from that software. And it also has to do with bit depth of your images. And it's something I haven't brought up before, but you will see it in every place you come and grab images, is that you can start, um, save your data as 8-bit or maybe 10-bit or 16-bit information per pixel. And what this means is that just uh, as I showed you the uh, uh, sound wave, that you divide it up into smaller fractions. In this way, you divide your color into smaller bins as well. So that instead of having 16 million colors that we normally have, we then start to have a billion colors. And instead of 256 grays, you now have 16, um, 32,000 gray scales. And that means that you have much better information to work with your image when you're changing contrast, changing exposure, and everything else like that. So if you have the ability to get in higher bit depth than 8-bit, you should do it in your acquisition software, and you should save it as that. The negative part that you will see is if you go above 8-bit for grayscale or 24-bit for color, you will not be able to see this in um, sort of your simple uh, Windows browser or uh, other simple software. They will only look nice in uh, software like InDesign, like Photoshop, and more advanced software. But that's expanding now more and more that you can use it in other software as well. But it's just something to keep in mind that the, it's the best information you can get in, but it can be a little bit more cumbersome to work with. So the other part here is actually the more important thing, and that's uh, thinking about your data, uh, where it goes, and how to change the size and rotation. It's so easy that we start to take in an image and we then say, oh, I want to rotate this a little bit, crop it, and adjust it. And that's before I even know where it will end up with, uh, how it will look in the panel in the end. Uh, what I always say is, don't touch the Im image at that point. Keep the original. And just make sure that your original is as clean and good looking as possible. And then you start spending the time on making your montage. When you have all data in, you make the montage in InDesign. And InDesign then has all of these abilities to crop, rotate, and adjust images in place without changing the original. And it may be so that you think that your image will be, end up as a square. But then if, when you make your montage, you say, oh, it would have been much nicer if it was oblong and had a little bit extra imaging information on the edges. And then it's a pity if you have rotated it, it and cropped it, and so you limit yourself. By keeping the original and all data you can, you keep that flexibility to go back and adjust and to make your montage in the end look nice. So all of that can be done directly from inside your montage in InDesign. And that's where it's much better to do it than starting from, the, uh, from Photoshop and doing it there. And scale boss and lettering is the same thing. That that's always much better to do in a vector-based software like InDesign, like uh, Illustrator, than making it in Photoshop. Because as we were talking in the uh, break, that it, when it comes then to submitting it to your journal, if it's pixel-based, the journal will take that image. Uh, it may be 300 dots per inch. You may see the text nicely looking there. And then they will compress it. 
because you always need to compress images for your PDFs to make them small and submittable over the net. So they will downgrade and uh, make your image maybe 150 dpi instead. And then your, all your text will be illegible in that figure. And you will get the PDF back and it will just look crap. But if you were to have it as a vector-based with text in it, um, that, that text will still look sharp. They will uh, downgrade the pixel-based graphics in it to 150 dpi, but the text will look as the original was. So this can really make a dramatic difference in your end product in that PDF. If you make it all of the scale bars and lettering and things in InDesign and not in Photoshop. So that's a really important to think about, that do all of these things in the end as well. And make the photo montages in InDesign, not Photoshop. Then, uh, so then there's not much left. If you think about the first part coming to your original acquisition and the last part coming to InDesign, you see that there are very few places where you actually need to use Photoshop. You can use it for fun for many things, but um, don't keep it as a main part of your workflow when making figures. So to know this well, you need to know when you're losing information and when you're retaining information. And this is one of those things that is a little bit dry and boring, but it's, it's very useful to know. And there are a number of vector-based file formats, and those are the ones that when you see them in your software, you should say, ah, these are the good ones. And uh, you should try to maintain things exported in that way. And the source of all of this comes from the PostScript file format. And the PostScript is a way of making a script for how a page would look, saying that up here there's a box, it has this size, and over here there's a text, and it has this and this parameters in it. It's, it's like programming, but for uh, layout. And it's very... Sorry, very similar to how our uh, web browsers interpret the web and make all of the web look that rich environment that we can see it. And this is the origin of all our vector-based file formats today. So from that, there come the encapsulated PostScript. And this is a very common file format that you would see in all professional software that's vector-based, but also in many of the good... Um, software that you acquire data um, from SPSS, from uh, uh, PRISM, from other places, you can export as the EPS file format. And what this is, is, is that it's taking the PostScript here that was used to present multiple pages of, uh, could be A4 or whatever it is, and make it to describe just one panel of a figure. So it, it does not contain everything about page size and multiple pages and things. It's just for one figure. And then it contains everything that you need to know. And it, it can contain both images and vector graphics. So if there is this composite in it, it will retain both things in the best way. Um, there are some pitfalls in this. And the main thing that it gives you issues is with the, your typefaces, with the fonts. And it's the thing that EPS files do normally not include the typeface. So it just includes the reference to the typeface. So if you export it on a Windows machine and open it on a Mac, it may not keep the right typeface. So your text may look disrupted. And I can show you how to get around that some places. So the, the reason why there was then developed a new, new file format was to be able to cope with these things. And from that came the portable document format, the PDF. And this, of course, you all knew, uh, work with daily. But what you can uh, say about this is it's taking the best of both of these worlds and putting them together into one and making more and more functions into it. So the PDF has all the advantages of the EPS file, meaning that it has vector graphics and image-based graphics, but it also can handle multi-page information. And it can store all the typefaces within that document. So you don't need all the typefaces that nature has to be able to draw the page exactly as they want you to. And it can compress your images. And image compression, I'll get back to a little bit later. And unfortunately, it also has copy protection. 
which can make life a little bit problematic when you want to extract images from uh, published papers, for example. Then we have the final format that you will see and work with when you're working in Illustrator, and that's the Illustrator proprietary format. And the Illustrator format, it's, you can think about it as PDF. It's very similar to PDF, but they just add some specific information that helps Illustrator to be able to work with this uh, document and to modify it with time. Um, it also gives you the ability to not include your pixel-based images in it, but just reference them so that they are linked to another place in your, uh, on your computer. And that's very useful when you're working with large images and you want to uh, adjust the image uh, post hoc and then go back and see the changes in the document. And it's very nice to have that one linked instead of integrated into the file. The Illustrator file, though, is only a single page. So that's the limitation compared to PDF, that you only have that as a single uh, page document. <coughs> so from all of this, you can then say that maybe I want to publish some of my nice illustrations on the net. And now we have a nice ability to retain vector graphics also for the internet, and that's called the scalable vector graphics. So that's something that you can also use to export data for, uh, for presentations on a home page and other places, where this will also look very nice. And they become very small files, quick to uh, communicate to other people as well. So the file formats to then be a little bit more hesitant to use are the pixel-based file formats. And it's like this, if you go from a pixel-based file format to an EPS and then back to a pixel-based, you don't lose anything. But if you go from an EPS file to a pixel-based file, you lose all the ability to edit your vectors in it. So as, as soon as anything has gone into a TIFF file, everything is lost for your ability to change your type to change any of those informations. So you want to make sure that if you start with start with vector graphics, you should never ever go into one of those pixel-based file formats. But if the data comes in uh, pixel-based from the start, say that it is a confocal image, then of course you can retain it in a pixel-based format. But you want to make sure then that you are not dis um, destroying the picture with time. And this is easier done than you would uh, think actually because there are these destructive pixel based file formats. So just so the, the non-destructive ones where you want to keep your images in are mainly the TIFF file format. And the TIFF is the original for all of this. It's a, um, originally it was uncompressed, did not do anything to your pixel based information. But now there's a very good ability to compress these files as well. And so normally there's a checkbox in your software saying that it can be with the LZW compression. And this compression is a way of just structuring data. It's compressing like zip compression for files. So the uh, file that you had from the original and the one that comes out in the end are identical. Just compresses it before it sends or before you, uh, yeah, when you store it and then uncompresses it when it uh, opens. So that is the good type of compression. It's not the most efficient way of compression, but it's absolutely the best way of doing it. So this is uh, the TIFF with the LZW. You can never go wrong. That's, that's the best place to keep your originals. It's small enough, but it's lossless. The PNG file format is also perfectly fine. It's uh, the new file format for the web, and it has some compression in it, but it also supports transparencies within the file, which TIFF does not. So this is a great file format for keeping uh, images that you want to in include in presentations. If you want to make a PowerPoint or a Keynote presentation, PNG files is the excellent choice for that. And then we have the last non-destructive is the Photoshop file format, and that also can, can contain some extra information in it, um, and that can be good if you have working copies of a file.
but the file format here is also proprietary, so it's not sure that all your software can open it. While the TIFF format is the most ubiquitous. You know that everything can open that. So then we have the destructive file formats. And why would you want something like that? Why would you want to destroy the data that comes in? And it has to do with the ability to make the file small. And you see that every day when you turn on your digital TV, your Blu-ray players, everything there is compressed with a lossy compression. So it means that you're willing to get rid of a lot of information to save space. And it's the same th thing in sound with MP3 uh, songs and everything like that. You get rid of a lot of information that you think is not needed for the core to evaluate the pixel, uh, picture. And that, uh, the one that you normally see with destructive pixel-based for still images is the JPEG file. So the JPEG file is actually getting rid of a lot of information and it's making assumptions in the image and it's compressing it in a way that you can never get back your original. So once it has been saved in JPEG, you lose some of your original information. How much you lose is dependent on the quality settings of, of your JPEG, but in all these settings, you lose more or less of that information. And that may not look very destructive in the first part, but the issue is like this, that it cannot make the same compression every time. So that if you uh, open a JPEG image uh, that has already been a little bit destroyed, you change something in Photoshop, you change the exposure, and you save it again. The JPEG compression algorithm sees this as a completely new image, and it takes away some more information. Then you open it in Photoshop again, change it, and it gets rid of more information. So the more you change in a JPEG image, the worse it will look with time. So it's a constantly degrading your image over all of that time. So the JPEG format is great for exporting, sending images to other people in uh, emails and other things because it's, they are so small, but they are really bad when you're working with an image. So you want to make sure that you are never storing a, a file in JPEG that is your working copy. So if you export it to JPEG, it should always be because you're sending it to somebody else and it should never come back into your workflow again. These are just for sharing for other people, not for your own workflow. That should be maintained here. And you will see that some consumer grade cameras are uh, using this file format and that's of course to save space and memory in the camera, but it's not something you want to maintain as that. So if you have, have an image that comes from there, the best is always to uh, open it up and change it to a TIFF, and then you have it. At least you are not making it worse. You have lost some information already with that JPEG, but you are stopping the, the constant degrading of that image. So that's, um, that's something to always be aware of, that uh, destructive uh, soft, um, File formats are good, but you need to handle them with care. So the next part I thought I could just give you a little bit of uh, tips and tools when learning how to use the software. And um, the best way to do that is just to show you a little bit of hands-on how this actually works. So if I just open up Illustrator, the First thing that is confusing in Illustrator is that you have two uh, pointers. Um, let me just restore this. So, and you see them up here. So you see that you have uh, one that is the selection tool and one that is the direct selection tool. And the reason why we have this is that we have all of these points with uh, things sticking out of them. So, and you need ways to uh, adjust both of these aspects. So, um, say that we start with a very simple rectangle like this. You see that this rectangle has only four data points, these anchors out here. And then it has the center of gravity being here. But that's the only information that this actually needs, is these four corners. But you may actually want to do either you want to move this hole and then you use 
the selection tool, the black arrow. But you may also, uh, and with this black arrow, you can do things to the hole. You can uh, change the size like this, and you can uh, pull the corner, but you can also rotate it. And then if you take it outside here, it changes into the rotation. And then you can quickly rotate it like this. So then you're changing the whole of this uh, structure. But the direct selection enables you to go in and change points. So I can take the uh, anchor up here, and I can now move that anchor down and start to change inside that figure. You can still go back to the selection tool, and then you can modify it the full and you can uh, do rotation and these kind of things as well. So that part is good for the direct selection is to know that this one is to be able to modify points specifically. So when you have a rectangle like this you only need uh, anchors. You don't need what we call the handles. But the handles are the parts that are giving you the ability to make, make soft curves. And the curves in Illustrator are made with this called the pen tool that I have up here. This guy there. And this pen tool has the ability to change a sharp corner into something organic. So when I change to the pen tool, I can now go in and actually either take away an anchor like this, or I can start to put new ones on there. And these guys can be soft ones. So if I want to create something that would be a circle instead, I can use points that are at the same place here. And then I can put handles out like so. So if you compare the two points that have handles versus the ones that are just points, you see that with handles I can start to make a soft shape. But it still has the same points. So I still need only four points to make something that starts to look like a circle. Of course, it's not a perfect circle, but you see it's starting to become a freehand circle. And the beauty of this is that I now can go in and change all of these handles. I can start to move them around and make infinite number of shapes. Just by these four points, I can four points and handles. And you see that the handle has two main components. It has a direction and a length. So that handle in itself is a vector because it has an origin, a size, and a direction. So that's why we have these vector-based graphics is that you get these directions and sm smoothness that you can then extrapolate uh, shapes out of that. So this is one of those places where you just need to spend time working in Illustrator, understanding how these work. So when you, if you want to make a sharp edge now? Yes. So uh, uh, one point like this can be either where the two handles are linked together like this. Or you have a tool that sits in the pen tool here, is that you can convert it into... A, uh, anchor point tool. And the anchor point then is, uh, so if I take the smooth one and I click on it, it becomes pointy. So you see now, now that it's, I uh, converted the smooth one into one that does no longer have um, handles on it. But there's a third alternative and that's to have one, let's see if I can modify this guy here, there was a way to do that. Um, let me just remember how to do. No, it's not it. Hmm. No. Let me see. There are always these things that you know you can do, but. Uh, I wonder how I can show that to you. At least there is an ability to have two handles that are not linked to each other. 
So you can make it soft all, already at that point. But you see the, the ability up here is that you can have something that is sharp towards one end and soft <laughs> towards the other. That's possible with just uh, making one into an uh, anchor point. But, uh, so you don't need to have all of them with handles in. That's definitely possible as well. Um, so the, the, that's very much of the basics of uh, Illustrator. But one other thing to make that you should keep in mind is that you can build a lot of shapes with just primitive shapes. So if you think about, uh, let's say that I want to make a test tube. And I want to make a test tube that is then sharp in the uh, bottom of it. I can use a very neat feature that is called the um, Pathfinder. So in the Pathfinder you have the ability to take uh, shapes like these guys here. Let me just take that one and make it roughly the same angle. And you have the Pathfinder up in your window here. So this one you can actually start to subtract different shapes from each other. So from this one I can take away the top shape by taking minus front. And then it sort of cuts that one away. I can just uh, this one out so that it will look roughly the same. This is a very quick version of that. So then you cut away everything that's in the front part of the other one. And then you can make complex shapes very quickly in that way. And you can make it like so, but you can also make something that is um, unifying two shapes. So if I want to make a very quick cap on this one, I could just make these two shapes together there and then I can unite these two from the, with the first one. And then I made a different type of shape that would fit nicely in here. So then by doing these kind of things you can easily create all the type of shapes you want not by not having to know how to make all of these Bezier curves. And you can use that in many w different ways, also by taking the intersection of two shapes. If you have, um, so let me just draw a s two circles <coughs> there. So if I want to make sort of a Venn diagram, I could uh, put these guys. So if you use the Alt uh, or the Option button, you can, uh, this is a nice Venn diagram, but anyway, uh, you can then uh, copy a file. And then you can have this one that divides them all up into all of these subsections. And now you can uh, start to take away all of these parts and I've created more of a complex, complex shapes that would all fit together, but you can pull them out like so. So that's another place where it's quick to get started with illustrators, just to use the primitives and use the pathfinder and make those together. And you can make all, almost all the shapes that you want out of that. A third tip is to actually start with something behind, so that you start with a drawing that you can then use as the template for what you want to draw. So this you can use is, if I take away these things, if I just place an image in here, Let's see if I could find uh, an image for that. Yeah. So th this is just uh, an example of when I needed to draw uh, a small circuitry of neurons. So this is a neuron-interneuron -neuron interaction. And I, I needed a, a starting point for an illustration. And th the best way is not to try to draw on freehand in Illustrator without any template behind. So I normally just sketch out something and it can look quite nasty, it doesn't matter. It just have something behind where you can start to then fit um, your image, uh, your illustration on top of that. And in here there's an easy way that you can make, so you can make different layers and you can have one layer which is where I have the image here. I can make that one dimmed. So I just dim it to 50% and I can lock that layer. So now I can't touch the image in the back. It's just there as the template. 
And the beauty of that is that you can then go in and start to draw on top of this. And then you draw again with a pen tool. And I want to be in the right layer. So, and I can now much easier approximate where, oh, sorry. If, uh, I started drawing this way. Where, how long you need to pull all of these guys. So, and you can see that it doesn't have to fit perfectly first because I know I can adjust this. So this type of thing, I can go in and it adjusts afterwards. You don't need to care about that. But you'd see how you can follow a neuron like this and make that here. And then, of course, you want to make sure that it's not filled. And going so. So you see that you don't need very many points to make an uh, organic, smooth figure like this. And then you pull it so. And then I can go in with the direct selection tool, quickly here, adjust this handle so that it's down. So I can now go in and, and fine tune all of that. And then pull this one a little bit further. So this is where it uh, takes a bit of experience and just uh, trial and error to make all of this fit nicely. But um, this was just a very quick way of showing how you can make something like that. Hmm? So Yes. Yeah. So I can show you some of these um, quick ways of doing that. So, so there there are two ways. Um, let me start with one of those. Um, if we just go with this way. So if we uh, think about this round circle here, and I want to make this look 3D. So the, the first and easy way of doing that is to actually just make um, a small circle that makes a highlight in it. And that you, what you can do is to copy this whole one um, and you make a small version of it like this. Just trying to make something that looked roughly the same as the other one, like so. And then you can use, here I'm just changing the look of that, so it's a, a light yellow. And then you can use the direct selection tool and just make this one a little bit curved, like, maybe not so much, but like this. So then you make it look like a sort of a billiard ball. That's the simplest possible uh, 3D shape. However, it may not look uh, perfectly uh, smooth. And it's what you can do from that is then to use uh, this uh, tool that is here. This is called the blend tool. And you have, uh, so you see me in there on the left. And the blend tool then gives you the ability to, uh, to make a uh, a smooth gradient from this one here down to here. So then it's, it makes a smooth transition from one to the other. And then that gives you a bit more of the highlight and soft shape of that. And what I can show you from this part then is, um, I'll get back to this shape a little bit later, but what you can also do is to make real 3D objects in, in uh, Illustrator. And that can be useful, uh, for example, in, well, let's see where I put that. It could be here. In the case where you want to make, say, a erythrocyte, and you want to have that nicely looking at 3D, you can start with something that looks like a cut through of the erythrocyte. And this is actually uh, a very simple starting point for that. That if you think about this, if you would take uh, this one and making it. Oh, no, that didn't want to eat. That's difficult to draw. So, so if you put these two together, that would be a cut through of it. So if you take just one of these, and you say in the effects of 3D here, you can have the revolve. And the revolve is taking this one 
and it's making a 360 version of it. So if I preview it, it now makes this 3D representation of it. And now you can start to move this around in 3D and you get something that can look quite nicely as a, a ritual site in there. So you can use all of these shapes and make a 3D version. What's nice is that this is still live, so you can go in here and you can change, say if I thought uh, this was a little bit too deep or too shallow, I can go in and fine tune it and uh, all of these parameters. And I can quickly also go in, in here in the effects afterwards and I can uh, double click on the 3D re revolve and if I get the preview, you can start to change the uh, orientation again and I can change my perspective a little bit. So, so you can quickly make, uh, like I did back here, you can make just uh, five copies of cells that look like they were oriented be behind each other. So, so that just is a single shape like this. All of them have it. So it's the same shapes, just uh, that you oriented them differently. So that can be a quick way to make a 3D look. Um, another way you can do that is to also, if we go back to this small little billiard ball like this, you can make this into um, something that can actually look like a lipid bilayer. So if I just uh, make sure that these are rightly aligned, and I made this one now like a, f a fraction here, let me see. So this is an example where I started to make something that I want to look like a lipid bilayer. And you then have these two balls with something very simple in between. And the, it's, it's on purpose why this is made simple, because when you have it like that, you can make this into a pattern brush. And the pattern brushes are um, in here. And I can say that I want to make this into a new pattern brush. And what it does now is just to take this as the source of the brush that I will um, draw. And then I can now make a smooth um, line, maybe something like this. This is just, uh, it was supposed to look like that. So you now see I have just a smooth line and I say I want to apply the pattern brush that I did from this one there. And then it aligns it along that line. So then you can very quickly make a nice bilayer that you can adjust all of these uh, shapes in it. <laughs> Sorry? For me, after the day. Yeah. <laughs> no, and that's the thing. If you can make it quickly uh, with the right tools, then, then you have these templates that you can uh, easily make into uh, all the different figures you would want. So, from this part, you may also want to make the bilayer uh, behind it. And what you can do then is to take this billiard ball again and I want to make that blend um, from here to here. But in this case, I want to make sure that the blend is, uh, has very fewer um, steps because it makes so many copies of these. So I want to make this only with three steps. And then you uh, see that this ball, it doesn't look that nice when you scale into it but it will uh, look perfectly fine when I make my pattern brush. So this is the uh, second thing now that you can, let's see where we actually have the pattern brushes. Ooh, ooh. I forgot where I have them. Do you actually see it there? On the right hand, didn't it? I thought I had the pattern brush. It's in an odd place, that's why I do not see it here. Okay, it should be possible to find... No. Let's see, is it in here? Is it pattern options? Yes! So, in the pattern options here, 
you can uh, say that I want to make a new pattern of this one. And now I have created a pattern with where this uh, ball is the center of that pattern. And now it just puts them lined up next to each other like this, which doesn't look so nice, but you can put them then in a brick row by row, and then you don't have them to be next to each other, but they can actually overlap a little bit like this. And then you can make sure that the bottom is on the top. And now you have all of these lipids lying next to each other. And then I can go and exit this editing mode. So now I have created a new small pattern that's here that actually is my lipid layer. So then I can go back and create, say, a rectangle that's below here. And I'll just add a, uh, a point to it so that I can pull it. So I just make a rectangle and make a point so that this one can be lying behind. And I put it behind the other one. And now in this square, uh, I can add that lipid to it. So then you have created all of this pattern where it's... Uh, the same balls is behind. So you can use these patterns to make also that part of them. So I think the, the pattern brushes and these uh, pattern shapes are very good to use for many things and also the 3D versions can help you get started with images. So these are uh, just some quick tips and I have uh, some others also on the videos that you can go through. But one thing I thought I'll spend the last 15 minutes on is how to get data into Illustrator because that's one of those key things that is important to know and um, I, I'll show you a couple of useful places so one is if you have a data set in prison that's a place where um, a lot of you may have graphs and things that are ready so if you ha just have a, a graph like this in prison you can see that you have two export options that are useful so you have the PDF and the EPS. So you now see that those are the two options you want to stick with, not all of the other parts here. Unfortunately, um, all software are different in their way. Some make great PDF files and some make great EPS files. But uh, So you should always, when you start working with the software, try one and the other and see which one makes the best e illustrated file. Um, in this case, I have, I think I looked at both of them. I honestly don't remember which one was best from this, but you can see um, the two different options. This was not the one. Okay, I'll just uh, export this one again as PDF. So we we'll, can start exporting it as PDF. Um, So now we have made the PRISM PDF file and I'll open that in Illustrator. And you see that it looks quite nice. You have everything in here. And then what you want to start looking is if the text is retained as text. And here all the text is editable. So you can see here that I would want to change this to 5500. I don't know why. but So this is looking very nicely exported and you can start to do all the adjustments that you want. But if you would compare that to the EPS that PRISM exports, it would not be as nice. Um, sorry, export. No. So this EPS, it's also uh, imported very easily into Illustrator and by visual appearance it looks identical to the, to the other one. But when you select everything here you see that now the text has been changed into these outlines. So it, it will print exactly as nicely as the PDF but it's much more tedious to work with this file in Illustrator because you can now not change I can't change the 5000 here to 5500 or change the lettering there, I would have to rewrite it. So you save a lot of time by just comparing the PDF format with the EPS and you see which one is the nicest to work with. 
So in the case of PRISM, it's the PDF way you want to stick with. But in other cases like SPSS, the e EPS file is much nicer to export. So uh, in some places, you want to stick to, uh, to the EPS and some in the PDF. You just have to keep notes on that yourself. Uh, however, there are also places where you cannot export as PDF or as EPS at all. And in, on the Mac side, this is quite easy. So if you just take any uh, web page you, or any file in the Mac where you can print, you can save it as a PDF file. And uh, so for those of you that have Macs, you, that makes life easy that you always have down here, you can save it as a PDF. So then when I save this as a PDF, you will be able to open it and edit it in Illustrator just as all the vector graphics. So that's a nice way out if you can't export it uh, directly in the file format, print to a PDF and you're safe. In Windows, uh, it's not as easy um, yet, but uh, I expect that, I haven't tried Windows 8, but I would expect it to be a little bit uh, easier than in Windows 7. But I thought I could just show you one small and free uh, tool that's very useful in Windows. And this is called um, Primo PDF. Um, so Primo PDF you can download um, from the web and it's a small software that makes a, a virtual printer. So it's a printer that's available on the computer then so you can select it instead of a normal printer. So if I just take a tool, uh, for example, this is from my QPCR, that is annoying in the way that it cannot export in useful file formats. So if I take this uh, one here and say that I would want to export it, I can export save an image as. And normally when you see it as an image, you know that it will probably destroy the data in it. But let me just save that one then as um, let me go in to let's go back. So that let's go here and let's just save this as uh, so then I save this as this image which you see that every, all the information in it is lost. You cannot now take away all of these dots in the background easily because everything is pixel-based. But then you now have the ability, when you have the Primo PDF in, I, I can instead say that I want to print, and my printer, I choose the Primo PDF. And I say OK. And then it opens this Primo PDF software where I choose that I can create a PDF. And I can do the same thing there, that I save this one in that folder there. And you can compare the two, this one. So this is the one that comes out from P Primo PDF. You now see that I have all the cycles and all the data points in here. And when I open this one in, in uh, Illustrator, that so then you can start to see that everything becomes editable in here. There, like so. So I can actually start to make uh, data fraud very easy in this way. So, but so of course you don't want to actually change your amplification curves. But in the, there are many places where you may want to get rid of the background grid, for example. And that is so much easier when you have a PDF like this. However, PDFs printed in this way have some issues. And you may see one glaring issue here, and this has to do with the type. So the printed ones are not as good as the ones that come from your journals. They may not always have the typeface in them, uh, and it's not included in the right way. So in this case, you may uh, see um, the, the, all the legends being gone. Then there's a quick way around this, and that's something that you will probably need to go back to the uh, 
video of this is that you can get around that by placing the PDF into Illustrator. So what I did now was to open the PDF, but if I go in in the file and say place, and I go back to the exact same PDF as I exported recently here, um, this one they call document there, and I say to link this one. It's very important that it's linked there. Then it creates just a link to that page. You see it has this cross over it, and now all of the text is visible in it. But I cannot edit this one at this point. So what I need to do is then to go in to here and say flatten transparency. And in that one I can say that everything should be vectors and I should create text should be converted to outlines and no strokes to outlines. And then it keeps the text but it makes all of those outlines as I showed you in the earlier. Um, so this is sort of the uh, intermediate stage. When you cannot get the type in, in the right way, in the editable type, at least you can get it in as this version with the outlines. So then you get all the visual appearance in and you can start to now get rid of all of these things. There's another issue with uh, PDFs when you open them in Illustrator is that there's a lot of information in the PDF that's stored there that is of no use. So in this one, there are many, many boxes and things that are not visible, but are just around there. So when I try to select something, it just selects all of these outer boxes, and they are just there to represent the page and other things. So what you uh, have to do then is in uh, what's called compound paths. Uh, you or or yeah, and you release those. Um, Sorry, it's uh, clipping masks. I'm uh, mistaken. Those clipping masks. You can release the clipping masks, and then you release all of those things in there. So, you you want to release all of those clipping masks, and then you can go in and in path clean up, and then you can get rid of all of these empty objects that were out here, and now you have uh, only the things left in. So by releasing the clipping masks and cleaning up the paths, you can then get everything back to a nice file that you can edit well in Illustrator. So now I can go back and I can take away this white box and then yeah, there are some white boxes still here. So. No, they're gone. And then I can uh, now go in here and take, say that I want to bring all of that into a lighter gray. So then, then it's possible to make these uh, fine adjustments also into these files. So that's another place where you can uh, get use of Illustrator. Um, sometimes they just copy-paste into the Illustrator, but then it seems like all my text is like a bit off-center, mm -hmm. and that's it, I like, center all of it. Yeah. Is there an easy way to just center everything? Well... <laughs> The alignment uh, tool is good in some uh, places, um, but the copy-paste is risky. Sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. But it's worth to test it. Sometimes it's, it can be better than printing to PDF, sometimes it's worse. But, but uh, that's, that's also a possibility. But one thing I can show you is very useful, is the ability to distribute. And so if you say that I want, uh, I have the four boxes here, and I want to make sure that they are equal spacing. In this align tool, you have options. And these options here, you can actually go in and say that I want to distribute them uh, equally spaced. Now they were a bit o overlapping. But if I don't overlap them, I can distribute them evenly. And then it just gives the equal spacing in between all of these. So if you have the outermost of uh, uh, on your x-axis, the data, you can then take those and then distribute the other ones evenly in between. And it should align them well. So that, uh, that works well. The other thing that can work well is if you have a box like this and I have a type, say that this is uh, 657, and 
this type I want to put just in the center of this box, but I don't want to move the box. And this is what you normally uh, say. If I try to take this one and that one and say that I want to center them, you move both of the things. But that's often not what you want. So the good thing is that you have the transform box in that place. And in this transform box, you can define your point of reference. So you can have the point of reference in the center, in each extremity like this, or in any way you want. So if I then go in and say that I want to use this box, and I can steal the x coordinate for the center of that. So I just take all of that and copy it. And then I take for my lettering, and I say my x coordinates should be identical same. Then it moves it to be centered of that one. And you can use the same thing for making the left side. I take that left, and I want to have this on the left as well. And then I have left and uh, lined it. But for left and right, it's much more easy because it's so that it's using the extreme values for alignment. That So if I have uh, this box and the 657, if I align them left now, they will align to where the box is standing. If I align them right, it would align towards the seven. So you can see that th that one is predictable. So now the, uh, I can move in the 657, and then I can move the 657 there. So just by putting things in the right place where, before you want to align it, you can then know which one is moving. Um, another very useful feature in Illustrator is that in all of these boxes, you can put in whatever you want. So it says millimeter here, but it's not locked in millimeter. I can say this is one inch, and oh, not the position, I was thinking about the width. So if I say one inch instead, it will make it into one inch and then represent it in millimeters. But you can also do like this, that I want to have this 25.4 plus 3 millimeters, and then it makes this 28.4. So you can make simple uh, mathematics in here. And I can also say this, divide by 3. So I get a third size. So th that can be very good when you're working with graphs, that you can put in all of these things, scaling factors. And I can, of course, also put this to be 75%. That also works well. So it's, it's very flexible scaling in this one. Another thing I wanted to show you just briefly, and that will be the last one, is when you're working with a graph and you have opened it in Illustrator. Yes, something like this. So I'll just quickly clean this up. And, uh, so this is just a raw PDF that's in there. Okay. And we go in here. And you see that you have in SPSS, you have these double arrow bars. And that may not be something you would want to have in your final graph. So what you can do then is to go in here and select multiple of these guys. And so let me just uh, start by taking those here. And I want to make sure that they are arrow bars only on below in this case. I can go in in the object, transform, and transform each. And, it, and the difference between transform each and transform is in transform, if I would put 50% height, it would move all of these error bars in, in conjunction with each other. But if I choose transform each, and I have the reference here at the bottom, this is important again to make sure that they are uh, scaling them towards the bottom side, I can now say that these should be exactly uh, no, sorry, horizontal should be the right one. What did I sorry about that. Uh, transform each. And bottom references here and the vertical scale should be 50%. Then you can preview it and you see that it's scaling all of them down. So then I've now created error bars that are exactly the same size but they are just scaled towards the bottom half. So that's a very quick way to clean up graphs as well. So you don't need to sit with each of those. Um, so that, I th think, was the last uh, 
small tip. Great. Thank you all for coming.